Welcome to the fourth episode of our vidcast about Italian theatre at the Russian court. Let us take a closer look at the mechanics of repurposing intermezzi originally staged elsewhere for the context of the Russian court. The interlude Pritvorna Nemka, the fine German woman, staged in St. Petersburg in 1734, is not only the first instance of the libretto's revival north of the Alps, but also of its exportation to the still remote regions of the European opera network. Like other intermezzi, its stock conventional characters and situations pits a novorish against a young female servant girl who uses her wit to trick her master into marriage. The plot thus revolves around a matchmaking and its consequences. Charlotta, aware of Pantaleona's weakness for German women, pretends to be a German in order to entrap him into marriage. As for the sources of the Russian revival, it might be the same La Finta Tedesca, written by Bernardo Saddomese, with the music by Adolf Johann Hasse and premiered in 1728 at the Teatro San Bartolomeo in Naples, between the acts of Atolo Re di Bettinia. But it could also be the Florentine interlude that bears the same title, with the music composed by Giovanni Ranieri Redi for the 1729 Viriade at the Teatro del Cocomero which adheres to the first and the third parts of the Neapolitan Intermezzo. The two interludes seem to belong to the two distinct branches of the tradition, which, however, can be traced to a common archetype. There are, however, substantial differences between the Russian and both Italian versions. Part one, in which Charlotta enters Pantaleone's house, disguised as a German maid servant, and makes him fall in love with her, remains faithful to both Neapolitan and Florentine libretti up to the point of Charlotta's disclosure of her trickery and her true identity. The character's duet that follows this revelation, Setace Charlotta, if you be silent Charlotta, is changed into Se credessi di morire, if I were to die. The musical number is borrowed from La Finta Pazza, the fine mad woman, staged at the Teatro del Cocomero in 1732, which was in its turn a remake of Il Finto Chimico, the fine chemist, composed by Giovanni Cosimo Villefranchi and revived in 1723 in Livorno, featuring Pietro Pertici, a fact that explains how the substitute aria found its way into Pritvorna Nemka. Part 2 opens with Charlotte's monologue summarizing the events that happened after the end of the first part. The spectators find out that Pantaleone and Charlotta are now married and she intends to have a bit of fun with her husband, for he is so silly that it is impossible to live with him quietly. What we see next is how the two quarrel over Charlotte's excessive expenses, but in the end resolve to live happily ever after. Part 2 differs from both uh, Italian versions simply because it doesn't belong to La Finta Tedesca, but is borrowed from part 3 of Monsieur de Porsognacco, the interlude based on Molière's comedy. Monsieur de Porsognacco premiered in 1727 in Milan, featuring Rosa Ungarelli and Antonio Ristorini, and was followed by performances later in the same year at the Teatro San Samuele in Venice, the Teatro del Cocomero in Florence, and the Teatro San Bartolomeo in Naples. Since the Russian variant of Porsognacco is incomplete, with only general indication at certain points that an area was sung but without printing its text, 
It is not possible to establish on which version Milanese, Venetian or Florentine or Neapolitan it was based. Whichever it was, it is in any case clear that it was reduced down to its two first parts, as the third part migrated to St. Petersburg, La Finta Tedesca. Seen from the perspective of the production system, the intermezzo, as performed in Russia, belongs to the category of pasticcio, which was widespread in the 18th century. More specifically, it is not a pasticcio aborigine, that is an opera made of pieces from previous works by the same composer, or from newly composed pieces by different composers. It is a pasticcio resulting from exchanges between one singer and another, thereby guaranteeing the work's longevity on theatre stages, but at a price of radical changes to the original structure. For example, insertion of sections from other intermezzi, rearrangements, cuts, substitution of areas. If these composition procedures reveal little concern for the integrity of the original work, they also show that the staging of an opera was the fruit of collaboration between singers, arrangers and musicians. But how did local audiences receive the repertoire of the Italian company and what might their habits of theatre consumption tell us about their level of aesthetic connoisseurship? Padrecci Copere v Ostrovi Canarischi, the opera impresario into the Canary Islands, the very first interlude attended by the Russian court in 1733, featuring Pietro Pertici in the role of the impresario Nibio, and possibly Cristina Maria Avoglio or Giovanni Draia in the role of Dorina, can offer a useful glimpse into the Russian audience's reception of the Italian opera. Its source, L'Impresario delle Canarie, is an early example of a metatheatrical intermezzo depicting the world of opera and its protagonists, as well as the mechanics by which operas themselves were created and staged. The choice of the opera impresario in the Canary Islands as the first interlude ever produced in Russia was a smart move, for not only was the play one of the most acclaimed metatheatrical works of the century, but it was also a sort of mise en abyme of the events surrounding the company's own engagement for the faraway Russian land. In fact, its plot revolves around the impresario Snibio visit from the Canary Islands to convince the Italian virtuosa Dorina to accept a contract at his opera house. The prima donna lists a number of problems and excuses as to why she cannot sing. The keyboard is out of tune and she has other appointments, but she finally agrees to perform one area and one tragic opera seria scene, which inspires Nibio to sing a cantata of his own composition. In the end, the impresario asks the singer to sign a contract, but the resolution is open-ended. The flow of the action is not based on a series of consequent events, but rather on a series of conventional situations, such as the exhibition of Virtuosa's vocal talents or her enumeration of her immoderate requests. The comic effect is therefore based not so much on the logic of the plot, but on a burlesque of theatrical models, musical structures and the behavior of opera practitioners. The humor in these metatheatrical interludes was dependent on insider knowledge about opera's conventions and the audience's understanding of these conventions. Italian or European spectators of the 1730s would simply not laugh at the insider jokes about the singer's personalities and skills if they were not already sophisticated theatre-going connoisseurs. Precisely because the parodic intent of the metatheatrical interludes has to be apparent to the audiences, the opera impresario into Canary Islands constitutes an important source of information about the level of aesthetic sophistication of the culturally remote audiences for whom the Italian singers found themselves performing their standard repertoire. Additional evidence about the Russian spectators is provided by the textual structure of the libretti themselves. 
The Russian collection of Commedia dell'arte scenarios and intermezzi significantly differs from similar 17th and 18th century compilations because its function was not to serve as a working script for the actors, but to facilitate the spectator's understanding of the performance. Indeed, throughout the collection, the translator places the audience at the forefront of the performing event by explaining terms or situations that it might be not familiar with. For example, in the comedy Francis Vignatien, The Frenchman in Venice, Tridiakovsky describes what gondoliere and episodio mean. In The Fine German Woman, where the comic element is based on linguistic confusion, he translates phrases from both German and Italian. In the opera Impresario, he feels the need to explain to his fellow compatriots that the expression to applaud with both feet and hands in Italy refers to the audience's approval of the performance. While the European public was aware that Impresario delle Canarie denounced opera serio conventions, the Perich in Fia Intermedia, that is to say, summary of the entire interlude that introduces every work in the collection, provides a general background for the events about to unfold on stage and explains parody to the audience. Прочее всю критика, то есть охулка характеров, которые имели оного обоего пола люди театральные. The rest of the action is a critique, that is to say, a disapproval of the habits that people of both sexes involved in theatre had. The summary thus makes clear that the terms parody and satire did not exist in the Russian lexicon. Other musical terms that were apparently absent from the Russian 18th century vocabulary and needed to be explained to the audience are the scores, Bumagi Muzikanskie, literary musicians' papers, Prima Donna, the first person, orchestra, the place in theater where the musicians sit, libretto, kniga operska, literary opera book. That in Dorina's area, recitar è una miseria, the words parte buffa and parte seria are translated as igrat vajna ili smishnoya, that is, to perform something important or something that makes one laugh, suggests that Russian spectators had also not yet acquired a vocabulary for the codification of singers' roles and professional skills. Another indication of how well audiences understood what they were watching at the theatre or supposed to imagine while reading the libretto at home is provided by the audition scene in part one. After having listed the usual excuses uh, for not singing, a cold and out of tune spinet, and so on, Dorina agrees to perform an aria entitled Amor Prepara. While the opera star sings her number, the impresario Nibio continuously butts in with comments on her performance. Come, love, prepare, oh, swallow my chain, and then. From my freedom I resign. What a lovely tone. What a pleasant shake. You are a miracle. You are a prodigy of nature. You possess me. Very good. From your fetters freed. That's fine indeed. My heart cannot live any longer. Again, one more time, please. Nibius' last interjection, da capo in verità, this is truly a da capo, provides a metatheatrical reference to and burlesque of the classic form of the da capo area, whose effectiveness depends on the precise expectations of the spectators. This scene supplies audience a warrants of opera serio musical dramatic forms and achieves both its humor and its critical pungency by undermining these conventions. The Russian translation, one more time that again, please, in which Nibius' exclamation is instead taken to be a request to repeat the area once again, reveals the translator's misunderstanding of Nibius' comment because of his lack of knowledge of the burlesque musical dramatic conventions. 
Other evidence of the limitations of what the translator was able to understand and convey to the Russian spectators is found in part two, in which Nibio asks Dorina to perform a tragic scene in which Cleopatra is the protagonist. At first, the virtuosa refuses to satisfy his request because there is no orchestra to accompany her, but the impresario continues to insist, asking her to imagine one and offering to play the part of Marco Antonio himself. Could you do me a favor and let me enjoy that scene where you appear alone? I would be very pleased to do it, but without the lights, theater or instruments, and from close up, the action becomes small and the effect is lost. It does not matter. Imagine here the orchestra, where musicians sit, playing violins. And this chamber is a dungeon of some tower. Or what do you want? Then Cleopatra comes in with her pearl and cup. And if necessary, I will be Mark Anthony. What is interesting to note here is that First of all, the term a solo or da solo, which describes a scene in which a character is alone on stage, didn't have any equivalent in 18th century Russian. Furthermore, the instruments that Nibio invokes, violini e violoni, fiddles and six-string bass viols, represent typical elements of early 18th century Italian orchestra, characterized by the clear distinction between the high register entrusted to violins, oboes and possibly flutes and the low register, cellos and bassoons. This scene reveals the Italian audience's familiarity with the vocabulary related to the principal instruments in the orchestra. Tridiakovsky's omission of violoni from the translation points to the fact that neither he nor the Russian public was acquainted with the function of the bass viols in the Italian orchestra. This intermezzo parodies virtually all elements of opera seria, from its heroic style, archetypes and plot devices to its practitioners. A vain and temperamental singer and an amateur impresario who in his eagerness to exhibit himself sings an embarrassingly bad performance with music and verses of his own composer. But the explanations of musical vocabulary included in the libretto for the Russian audience and the omissions from the translation of words and terms that the translator himself didn't understand convey an image of an operatically illiterate spectatorship who were not yet able to grasp the targets of the interlude satire. The Empress's commission to translate the Intermezzi and Commedia dell'Arte scenarios performed by the Italian actors points to her intention to provide her subject with a tool for appreciating the performances and understanding them on more than just the surface level. The reception and consumption of Italian theatre in a Russian context at the time of Anna Ioannovna can be best described by Nibius words in the libretto. In trying to convince Dorina, who is reluctant to travel to the Canary Islands because she doesn't know the language and the local audience will not understand her singing, the impresario states that the texts are not important because the audience couldn't care less about the meaning. Нет в том вам никакой трудности, потому что слог речей в опере ни за что людям. Смак уже ныне в том переменился. Довольно, чтобы хорошо было пето, а на слова не смотрят. This is not a problem at all, because in the opera words don't count, and now that the tastes have changed, it is sufficient to sing well, and no one will pay attention to the words. At the time of the engagement of the second Italian company, the Russian court was most probably perceived as a magnet for theatre practitioners trying to better their lot. By 1734, however, when the troops' contract reached expiration and most of the operisti decided to return to their homeland, St. Petersburg came to be seen as an opportunity to reinforce the performance professional skills, their suitcases and their artistic credentials. 
Since the ensemble was not hired as a unit, but consisted of actors and singers with multifaceted artistic backgrounds who found themselves working together, the circumstances led to the enhancement of their skills and their trunks of arias, libretti and other musicalia, as the cases of Pietro Pertici, Rosa Rovinetti Bon and Pietro Mira alone prove. In fact, there is no evidence of Pertici performing in Impresario delle Canarie prior to his Russian stay. Whereas, judging from the performances in Venice in 1741 and 1742 and in Parma in 1749, the part of Nibio would become one of the singer's signature roles. The St. Petersburg court provided not only an inviting working place for roaring actors, and indeed some of them returned to Russian for a second time, as was the case with Francesco Ermano and the choreographer Giovanni Antonio Sacco. It was also a launching pad for the brilliant careers several of them would go on to have. For the actor and dramatist Giovanni Camillo Kanzaki, the Russian tournée led to an appointment at the Saxon-Polish court of August the 3rd. It was also a turning point in the careers of Cristina Maria Avoglio and Costanza Piantanida, who went on to become Handel's favorite singers in London. During his Russian stay, Pietro Mira gained the Empress's trust and the position of court gesture, which led to his further high appointments in Dresden. Pertici, who was described by Carlo Goldoni as il più bravo attore del mondo, the best actor in the world, became widely recognized as one of the most talented performers of the century, who in 1750 was appointed director of the newly formed National Tuscan Theatre in Florence. It is highly probable that both Pertici's comic gift and his administrative skills were sharpened by his early Russian experience, when actors-singers also acted as translators and arrangers of their works and played a crucial role in programming the repertoire. A similar pattern can be seen in the artistic career of Antonio Sacco. Employed both as actor and dancer during his Russian tournée, Sacco went on to become a famous Truffaldino and the favorite actor of both Goldoni and Carlo Gozzi. His fame in Russia probably lasted late into the 18th century, as the Prince Paul and his wife, during their stay in Venice, preferred to attend Sacco's performance instead of a ball given by the Venetian nobility. Appointments in St. Petersburg also led to prestigious positions at other European courts for the actors of the third company, such as Rosa Rovinetti Bon and Domenico Cricchi, both of whom found employment at the Saxon court first and later at the court of Frederick the Great of Prussia. Eh, esistono poi naturalmente in questa massa più o meno, meno distinta, diciamo così, eh, Esistono forti personalità di eh, attori che emergono, attori e attrici che emergono prestissimo e quindi eh, naturalmente questa storia, anche se resta una storia collettiva, è una storia di collettivi familiari eh, e anche continua a essere una storia di attori segnalati, di grandi attori. In conclusion, it is worth noting that the second company paved the way for St. Petersburg's status as one of the most significant destinations for touring actors, musicians, instrumentalists and theatre designers. Thanks to this company and the ensemble that followed its steps, theatre in Russia was soon upgraded from a pure court entertainment to a state event and St. Petersburg's Italian opera came to be the equal of Europe's most respected theatres. Mm -hmm.